recognized by the My Climate Risk at Ateneo de Manila University Regional Hub, which is hosted by the Ateneo Institute of Sustainability. My Climate Risk, or MCR, is a lighthouse activity of the World Climate Research Program, which aims to develop and mainstream a bottom-up approach to regional climate risk. This starts with a better understanding of local context and the requirements of decision makers, hence our webinar series, where we will explore the different contexts and experiences of climate change impacts. We are delighted to be bringing back this webinar series and to see some familiar names join us in today's event. It's also great to have uh, with us some new names, and we hope that you stick around and become a part of the My Climate Risk community. We would like to also thank our colleagues at Dakila and Active Vista for their support of our event today. Just some reminders before we start the program. First, please note that the program is being recorded on Zoom. On Zoom, all participants are asked to mute themselves as they enter the meeting room. And throughout the session, please type in any comments or questions in the chat box here uh, on Zoom. Participants via Facebook Live may also type in their comments or questions in the comments section. We will collect all of these for the open forum later on. And finally, there will be an evaluation survey at the end of the session. Requests for e-certificates may also be made through the same form. At this point, we'd like to ask everyone to settle in for the prayer to be followed by the Philippine National Anthem. I invite everyone to make the sign of their faith as we say the interfaith prayer for our climate. We hold the earth. We hold siblings who suffer from storms and droughts intensified by climate change. We hold all species that suffer. We hold world leaders delegated to make decisions for life. We pray that the web of life may be mended through courageous action, right actions for adaptation and mitigation to help our already suffering earth community. We pray that love and wisdom might inspire my actions and our actions as communities so that we may, with integrity, look into the eyes of our siblings and all beings and truthfully say, we are doing our part to care for them and the future of the children. Love transform us and our world with a new step toward life. Now, uh, to formally welcome everyone to today's webinar, I am pleased to share a message by Dr. Regina Rodriguez on behalf of herself and Dr. Theodore Shepard, the co-chairs of the Scientific Steering Group of My Climate Risk. Hi, uh, I'm Regina Rodriguez from the Federal University of Santa Catarina in Brazil, and I co-chair uh, uh, 
uh, the WCRP Lighthouse Activity My Climate Risk with Ted Shepard from the University of Reading in the UK. I wanted to thank you for having me here to say a few words about My Climate Risk. So uh, the new science that is pictured within My Climate Risk is not around models or observations or process, process understanding, but on how they are all used together with, uh, within the context of a deep uncertainty. Specifically, my climate risk aims to develop and mainstream a bottom-up approach to regional climate risk, which is start from uh, the decision uh, context and the decision scale and enables relevant climate context by developing a new local scale. So um, in this sense, we reflect on the insights provided in a different context, that of economics by E.F. Schumacher in his celebrated book, Small is Beautiful from 1973, to see what light they might shed on the challenge of inverting the construction of a climate information for local to regional climate risk. Uh, Schumacher asked how economics might look if it was structured as if uh, people mattered. Uh, we ask the same question of a climate change science and find many parallels. One is the need uh, to deal with the complexity of a local uh, situations, which can be addressed by expressing climate knowledge in a conditional form. A second is the importance of a simplicity when dealing with uh, deep uncertainty, which can be addressed through the use of a physical climate storylines. Uh, and the third one is the need to empower local communities to make sense of their own situation, which can be addressed by developing intermediate, what you know, Schumacher called intermediate technologies that build trust and transparency. So that's why uh, uh, we propose our structure around the non hierarchical ecosystem of a labs, community of practice, like a micro hazel network, sharing resources rather than competing for them, and anchored uh, by mother trees in the form of regional hubs, similar to the concept of the Wedwood Web by Susan Shinard. Uh, these are our current hubs, uh, uh, and we have uh, many of them, the majority in the global south, uh, south that's what we are uh, um, uh, proud of and all sharing our uh, principles. So uh, th this I hope that uh, uh, will be a fantastic, I'm sure there will be a fantastic webinar series, a safe place to drive discussion and insights from different community sectors and experience uh, to achieve a more actionable climate research and to promote a more open and equal concept of a collaboration that can help local communities and stakeholders to make sense of the experience of climate change and define their climate information needs. Always focus on exploring this bottom-up approach from a human perspective in a context, in this case, of Southeast Asia, which is the essence of my climate risk. So with that, uh, I wish you all a very fruitful uh, series and, with, and I thank you for sharing our principles. Uh, much appreciate. Thank you for being part of my climate risk. Thank you. We extend our gratitude to Dr. Rodriguez for those remarks on behalf of herself and Dr. Shepard, and for setting the tone not just for the session, but really for the whole series. Indeed, we do aim to provide this safe space to drive discussions on climate risk and how different sectors experience climate impacts. Throughout the five webinars we will be holding until May, we will be exploring these climate impacts through different disciplinal lens. It's now my pleasure to introduce the speaker for today's session. Joshua is a young queer environment and climate justice activist, campaigner, and organizer. He heads the Climate and Environment Campaign at Dakila, seeking to present environmental concerns within the context of human rights. He started as an anti-coal youth activist at just 16 years old. He co-led the successful youth campaign against a proposed 300-megawatt coal-fired power plant in their province in 2019. 
Because of his work for environmental justice and its impact on protecting people's rights, he was nominated in 2019 for Amnesty International's Ignite Awards for Outstanding Young Human Rights Defender and was invited to address education leaders in the Philippines during the third National Climate Change Conference and has also been a speaker on side events at the 28th UN Climate Summit or COP28. Recently, he started and is currently leading a local movement called Negrosanon Initiatives for Climate and Environment, or NICE, which aims to leverage a people's movement to ensure sound environmental governance and people-centered climate action. He is also a columnist and is actively working with various groups, formations, and alliances in his country and beyond. He has worked with various international and local NGOs, groups, and movements to pursue social justice and human rights advocacies. Please join me in welcoming our speaker, Mr. Joshua Villalobos. Mr. Villalobos, the floor is yours. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. I hope that you can hear me well. Hello from Negros Occidental, a, a province that has just declared classes suspensions because of the high heat index. Um, I'm originally from Bacolod City, but I'm now studying in the Maguete and Siliman. And both provinces in the island have been suffering for um, high heat index for the past few weeks. And in fact, classes a um, few weeks ago has just been conducted on during mornings so that uh, children and students can go home in the afternoon because of the uh, high temperature. And now uh, classes have already been suspended. And as recorded yesterday also, there have been 12 grass fires in in Bacolod City and Negus Occidental. So what that means is that uh, we are talking of, of a very real life uh, topic here, a very real life scenarios that uh, we are experiencing. And I'm happy to join um, and be a speaker in this inaugural session of um, this series of webinar. And But first of all, uh, before all of that, I would like to thank um, Ateneo Institute for Sustainability for um, inviting us, Dakila and Activista, to be part of this webinar series. And I hope that you can just see my presentation okay. I hope that it doesn't, uh, it is not being covered by anything. But um, so today my topic will be about the role of storytelling and activism in the pursuit of climate justice. Um, as mentioned, I'm from Dakila, and please allow me to introduce our organization as well. The whole name of Dakila in English, that's nobility. Uh, Dakila, or the Philippine Collective for Modern Heroism, it's a broad group of individuals, artists, students, and educators, workers, and others committed to advocating social consciousness formation among their communities and the society as a whole. Uh, but when you introduce the Kila, we always say uh, it's an organization founded by artists, but now it has already expanded its membership to young people, students, and activists. And currently, a lot of the majority of the membership of the Kila are uh, from young people and students. We also have several members that are studying in Ateneo, um, and we have collaborated with Ateneo and its various bodies in implementing activities. Dakila was founded by several artists, including Tado, if you still know him, Noel Cabangon, um, Bui Meneses, and others. Um, so that's our organization. So as I've mentioned, my main topic for today will be about storytelling and activism and how the, the work that we do um, in Dakila in order to contribute to this, to the bigger social movement in pursuit of climate justice in the Philippines and also beyond. So this is, when, when we talk about storytelling, I think one of the most inspiring stories where, that we can talk about, in, when we look at the um, immediate memory pre-pandemic, is really the story of a 15-year-old who inspired a global movement for climate action that from a one person um, protesting outside the Swedish government to inspiring millions of young people to leave classes and also be part in demanding governments and corporations for action and also to 
um, inspire climate action from various levels. This is one of the powerful stories that we uh, that we've learned and are really inspiring us in continuing the work that we do. And why do we continue to do these things? Because despite of all, uh, as I as mentioned earlier, I have attended one uh, UN Climate Summit, the uh, most recent one, the most recent negotiation. Thirty years of climate negotiations. Um, we're seeing the data shows and the scientists in, I think, and Atene would agree that we are lagging behind in terms of the goals that we have set ourselves, particularly in Paris, uh, for the Paris Agreement and uh, the rest of other goals that we have set for ourselves as a planet. And um, we know exactly, I think, as a, as, as a species, we know what we are lacking and we know uh, that it's being caused by, in, by an action and also among other things. But apparently, unfortunately, uh, we're still not acting on it as we should. It is not being taken care. It's not being taken care of and being not acted upon on the scale and speed needed to respond to the crisis that we are in. Um, naglagay lang ako ng mga pictures na no, kasi baka sabihin nyo, ang dakila ay uh, activist activist lang at hindi nagi engage sa formal negotiations and uh and other spaces um I, I i i highlighted this because this is really one of the misconceptions on activists that um we usually just shout from the outside and doesn't actually participate in the discussions on the inside um but many many activists a lot of activists in various levels from local governments to for, to our national governments in even into um international negotiations a lot of civil society and activists are part of the of the discussion and are really are essential and critical uh, members of of the critical members of the body that really pushes for more ambitious decisions uh, and i will talk about that later more about that later also and when we talk about climate justice, I think that has been a buzzword for a few years now. But what does that really mean, right? When we say climate justice, justice uh, based on what? Justice where? Is it a case that we need to win somewhere else? Um, or is, is it because a country committed a crime against us? So I think it's, it's a, there's a... It's important to understand that I think until now, there's no definite definition of the word climate justice or the phrase climate justice. And, um, but I think this can be illustrated in these um, next photos. On my slide right now, you can see the countries who have, all of the countries and their contribution to uh, the global CO2 emissions that are currently in the atmosphere right now. And the biggest squares are those who, of course, also has the bigger contributions to historical CO2 emissions. And I think you can see here na yung mga pinakamalalaki, ayan, US, um, also the EU, China, Russia, um, India, and Ukraine, South Africa, Japan, among the most dominant ones. And you cannot almost see the Philippines here. But if we zoom in a little closer, we are here. Yan, uh, yung may circle. Our contribution is, as they said, uh, it's one third of 1%. Though based on this graph, it's 0.2%. But um, I think the, mo the more uh, accepted or widely accepted statistic is the one third of 1%, our contribution to the global CO2 emissions. And... At the same time, based on various rankings and based on various scientific um, researches, we always are we always are in the top ten or top five or top three, and um, in some instances even the first in terms of the risk index, meaning um, our risks are very high in terms of the climate-induced disasters, and also among other impacts of the climate crisis. So if you look at uh, the current scenario where we are 
contributing one-third of one percent to the global problem, but at the same time you're experiencing the worst impacts of the climate crisis, then I think it's clear. You can see the injustice there that um, hindi tayo yung gumawa ng problema, pero tayo ang nag experience ng worst of the impacts of the climate crisis. And this is just even on the country level. If you look at, uh, at the society level or at the people level, you and you consider the emissions versus the impacts being suffered by the people, you will know who, who has contributed more to the climate crisis based on their emissions at saka sino ang mas pinaka-apektado. And we all know that uh, in our society, the most affected ones are always are the poor and the vulnerable and marginalized sectors of our society. And we know who that who that is. No, alam natin kung sino yan. At um, if we also uh, include the concept of intersectionality and compounded difficulties, dyan natin makikita na um, your identity also contributes to your um, vulnerability. So halimbawa, pag babae ka, uh, looking at this at a gendered lens, then of course you're also more uh, vulnerable and more affected and disproportionately affected to the impacts of the climate crisis. Kapag bata ka, kapag uh, young person or particularly children, they're they're also more disproportionately they're also disproportionately affected by the by the climate crisis. No, and that's one of the things that we worked on at uh, the 28th Climate Summit. I was involved with the UNICEF team and. Uh, we were working hard with the negotiators to 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 lobby a uh, text on the on the, on the decision text na magkaroon ng expert dialogue on the on how children are disproportionately affected by the climate crisis and fortunately that was accepted by the parties and this June for the Bonn Climate Summit they will be having that and hopefully the result of that this of that expert dialogue will inform the future decisions of uh, the UNFCCC negotiations. And another one also, this is also something that uh, civil society are pushing for, that find um, that we should also look at the responsibility of corporations in the emissions that we have right now. And this is based on a study released six years or seven years ago that actually only 100 companies are responsible for 71% of global emissions. And we know uh, who these companies are. We can name them. And in fact, they have been named um, in the Philippines, for example. Various civil society organizations have already have filed a case uh, to the Commission of Human Rights uh, for a national inquiry. And that national inquiry um, ended and there was a uh, a results published and our CHR said it's one of the landmark decisions it said that uh, these corporations actually have a responsibility and accountability on the climate impacts that we are in right now so this this is also why um a lot of civil society organizations are pushing that when we talk about climate finance or money to fix the climate, that's, I think that's it for uh, easier understanding, to either mitigate or adopt, it should not only come from countries, but also it should come from the biggest polluters. And when we talk about biggest polluters, these are the corporations, particularly fossil fuel corporations, um, cement corporations, and others, who have caused majority of the uh, global emissions that we, are, we have right now. And yes, just please feel free to uh, jump in if you want to say anything just send it in the chat we'd be happy to accommodate and make this a conversation and kapag naman storytelling ay dapat lahat tayo ay may contribution and it's also the logical process so for example on this one we can see how activism have played a crucial role in the negotiations um, I'm not sure no, how familiar are you with the negotiations process but uh, this is an annual gathering of global leaders where they talk about and decide on the future of our planet, basically. And, and in these negotiations, activism has always been, activism and storytelling has played a crucial role in raising ambition and pushing for action. 
for example, in the first picture, um, on the COP twenty one in twenty fifteen in Paris, um, the call of the activists there in the civil society is to have a climate treaty, and this conference of parties, as we all know, uh, produced one of the most important treaty in the world right now, and that's the Paris Agreement. So. If you're not convinced by that, the most recent, the more recent ones here are also, are also here. In, I included it that in twenty COP twenty seven in in Sharm el Sheikh in Egypt, the demands of activists and uh, mostly young people in civil society there is for the countries to establish a loss and damage fund, uh, a fund to compensate the losses and damages brought about by the climate impacts. Uh, particularly by global South countries or poorer countries like the Philippines and other uh, Pacific countries. And there was also uh, countries agreed to, to have a loss and damage fund. And more recently in Dubai, in the United Arab Emirates, the demands of the civil society there, um, that's a good question and we should go back to that later, um, the demands of the civil society there is um, to already mandate a uh, phase out of fossil fuel. And this is the first time in 30 years of climate negotiations, even though we knew that um, fossil fuels are causing the, is causing the climate crisis, yet we continue to use them. And there have been no mentions mention of the word fossil fuel in the past 29, uh, 27 COPs. Uh, in the decision text, and this is the first time that there was a mention of fossil fuels, and the text says that the world should transition away from fossil fuels. So all of these examples actually shows how activism contributes in, in increasing ambition and really pushing governments and uh, our negotiators, our representatives there, to choose our planet and to choose the people over the profit of some and the interest of 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 political identities and also corporations that are profiting the most from the climate crisis. And since I've mentioned that this is also going to be about storytelling and the, um, the session will be about um, how the role of storytelling in the pursuit of climate justice, according to cognitive psychologist Jerome Brunner, is that a fact wrapped in a story is 20 to 22 times more memorable than the fact alone. So perhaps you would forget this fact because it's not wrapped in a story. But um, this is one of the things that we are trying to address when we talk about communications and climate change. Because we know that there's a lot of data, there's a lot of statistics, and we thank our scientists for that. We thank our researchers. We thank the um, academics and the experts who are working on to produce the best available science for our governments to to, and for us to also make use as references and base our decisions, actions, and policies there. But sometimes, just communicating facts is not the most effective um, in terms of memory, recognition, and also appeal, right? So this is why um, in Takila, we try our best to storify things and also uh, to use creative communications in uh, making facts more memorable and we do it particularly in the forms of films. Um, the Kila doesn't produce films, but we usually partner with um, social impact filmmakers. Um, and we have, uh, in, in partnering for various films, and for this one, one of the most recent um, efforts was the screening of the Emmy-nominated documentary on environmental defenders of Palawan called Delicado. We have also organized several screenings of Delicado in, in Ateneo. Sorry. Um, we have organized different screenings of Delicado in Ateneo. And um, we also organize uh, film screenings um, based on various topics. And usually we also have our activista international human rights festival 
uh, it started as a film festival and now it's it has become a festival beyond the films because there are now activities more that are happening beyond the films and it's happening usually in the week of Marcelo on September um on the declaration of Marcelo I'm sorry so um for this for the previous years we have strengthened our campaign on environmental and climate change um education and communication particularly with the use of films um, as I've mentioned, the film is uh, entitled Delicado. It's an it's a film on environmental uh, defenders in Palawan. Um, if you haven't seen this, you should. And if you want to organize a screening in your organization, for example, or in your um, schools, just uh, let us know. We'll be happy to bring the film to you. Um, and... One of the things that that we do when we organize film screenings is that we just don't show the film. But we really try to use the opportunity of screening the film to spark conversations and conscientize people of why the film is produced. And for example, when we when we uh, screen and then we show people the story of environmental defenders in Delicado um, or in Palawan, it's not just for them to empathize and um, know or be informed that the environmental defenders in Palawan are facing such great risks. But it is also for them to acknowledge that these threats to environmental defenders are happening all, over, all around the country. Uh, it's, not, it's not an isolated case in Palawan, but it's actually all around the country. And according to Global Witness, the Philippines is actually... Uh, the deadliest country in Asia for Lani environmental defenders for the past 10 years. Um, so that's already, uh, every every year they do the ranking and for the 10th year now, or maybe the, that was last year in 2023, we're still the number ten, the number number one in Asia. So it's already 10 years and we're still number one in Asia in terms of the deadliest country for the environmental defenders. And of course, that are happening, uh, that is happening amidst the impacts of the climate crisis that we are already facing and we're already struggling against. And in fact, I also did my study on, um, and the question of nuclear is also noted, thank you. Uh, I'm also doing my study on environmental defenders, particularly youth climate activists in the Philippines. And um, that's also one of the major concern, really. It's it's the threats to environmental defenders. So that's why it's also a challenge for the Kila in how to hone uh, various ways of creative activism that um, also protects and values the safety of activists while still ensuring that the message gets across in the campaign and the fight for climate justice and climate action continues. So this is one of our uh, major platforms, really, when we use storytelling uh, for the Kila, it's through films. And uh, last year also, during the 10th anniversary of Typhoon Haiyan, one of the strongest uh, typhoons ever recorded in the world, is that uh, we organized another film screening. And this was a funny... Uh, this, this was a funny event because there was a well-known person. He is an artist. Uh, and he sa TV and then he decided to attend the screenings and then we were happy to have him, of course, because he's uh, uh, he's well-known. And then during the open forum, he actually uh, spoke out and tried to deny climate change. Um, thankfully, we have climate scientists on, uh, on the panel and also it brought the more interesting discussion of in, it, it, the importance of narratives. Because in any campaigns, may it be climate change, may it be um, campaign against extrajudicial killings, may it be campaign for peace, may it be our advocacies for human rights, it will always be a war of narratives. It will always depend on whose narrative is better and who has the bigger machin machinery to um to spread their narrative and to spread their story. And in climate change, that's also happening. Um, a lot of people 
have been denying climate change. And we know that because that has been a well-funded campaign with the fossil fuel corporations. There have been evidence of that, um, that fossil fuel corporations have been funding campaigns to discredit climate change. And now, because of the undeniable science, thanks to the experts and the scientific community, their messaging has actually shifted. Their messaging before is to say that climate change is not true. But now what they're saying is climate change is true. We're already in a crisis now. We are beaching the target and we're not gonna, uh, there's no hope. We should not, uh, there's no hope. We can't do anything about it. And it's a defeatist, uh, it's a defeatist perspective. It's a defeatist narrative. All it wants to do is to discourage people to act on the planet and to act on the climate and also to for them to continue their business as usual of burning fossil fuels so that they can continue making profit amidst the suffering of many people um, caused by the climate crisis. So as I think, as one of the climate uh, leaders said, she's Christiana Figueres, she's one of the uh, one of the critical person that made the Paris Agreement happen. She said that the, the gloom, doom and gloom um, scenario is now the newest, the new form of climate denialism. That's how you deny climate change now. When you say that we can't do anything about it, it's there, um, it's happening, we should just, it's like saying that we should just surrender, we should not do anything about it because it's already there. So um, they're also building evidence right now that it's that campaign is also being funded and supported and amplified by the biggest fossil fuel corporations, unfortunately. Um, this is also one very um, inspiring film that also inspires the work that we do in Dakila in using the film as uh, in using films as a vehicle for uh, storytelling and educa educating the public. Um, is Al Gore's uh, film in the Inconvenient Truth. Uh, in the decade that followed its critically acclaimed release, for example, sales in solar power generation industry increased by 6,800%. The Paris Agreement was signed, more searches for climate change and other topics. Um, and of course, there was a global discourse surrounding the topic of climate change. And I'm not also saying that it was just because of the film of Al Gore. But um, definitely, we should factor in how this film um, help in in this global consciousness on the on the on the climate crisis and how all of us should work to and uh, identify ways on what can we do to help and that's also how we see things in the Kila. We don't believe that um uh, the using films is the panacea or the solutions to all of the edu lack of education problem or lack of communication problem, nor we see activism as the only way to influence leaders or to um, help uh, address the climate crisis. But we're, we're not saying that. We're not saying that it's going to solve the climate crisis. But what we're saying it, what, what we're saying is these are contributing to um, to the achievement of the in the pursuit of climate justice and in, in the pers in the pursuit of climate action, meaningful climate action, um, and the and um uh, the achievement of a just society in the future. Um. So recently, because like rec also recognizing the impacts of films, particularly in the context of the climate, in the crisis that we are in right now, we have trained thirty six filmmakers. Uh, what we did is that we organized a climate story lab. We opened applications for it. We received hundreds of applications from young filmmakers um, and also all film filmmakers alike. Um, and we have started training them. Um, we've paired them with uh, film experts and directors and producers so that they can get also industry experience and at the same time, we've also linked them with other climate-focused uh, civil society organizations like Action Clima, um, WWF, um, Living Laudato Si, and other organizations that can help them in 
um, better framing their their climate narratives. So currently, there are fifteen short projects, short films in the makings, and also three feature films or longer films in the making because of this fellowship. And we hope that um, these films will also be beneficial in educating communities, young people, and uh, in pushing for action really, you know, to various stakeholders and particularly for GT bearers of our society. Uh, this is an ongoing training uh, with the assistance of uh, the British Council. So, uh, yes, we're looking forward to 18 new films um, in part because of this partnership of Dakila and also because of the talented Filipino individuals who have decided to continue to tell stories about the climate crisis. And But the thing is, even though Dakila uses films, uh, you don't need to be a filmmaker to tell your story. And... All of us have a climate story, whether that's um, all of us have a climate story, whether that's you experiencing a strong typhoon before, or whether that's um, currently us experiencing a very high in high heat index, or um, you lost a loved one because of typhoon Haiyan or because of typhoon Ondoy, and or also doing things to help the planet, right? Because climate stories doesn't always need to be um, tragic, doesn't always need to be tragedy, but this is also our um, campaign call for the Kila is that we should not give up hope in terms of the climate crisis because once we give up hope, we think, we think that that's already the end game. They've already won over us. So um, for the Kila, we continue to encourage people, you, me, all of us, we all have our own climate story. We can uh, tell this to our various audiences. It can be our, through our social media. It can be through our um, it can be through our family and friends. because aside from the helpful facts and statistics that we are always seeing in our various social media channels, we need to make those statistics and facts more human. People need to feel it. People need to taste it even. People need to hear it. People need to continue to understand that these are real things. And these are not just numbers. These are not just statistics, but these are things that are happening currently in the ground. And in our life as well. And I started with a story, and I would also want to end with this kind of story. I want to tell you the story of the uh, ozone layer. When we were young, and of also climate denial, uh, yung mga nagdadenay ng climate change has also used this story. But when I think me, for example, when I was in elementary, we were always... Um, thought not to thought not to burn plastic, not to use CFCs because it's gonna uh, widen the hole in the ozone layer. But now, according to I think that was a twenty twenty two report of the United Nations Environment Program, it's actually seen that in twenty sixty five and in that the ozone layer will be fully healed. And I think what this means or what it says to us is that there is actually hope. If we can do what we did when we and what what did we do during that time? We avoided um, CFCs, we banned various products that have CFCs, we changed business models, we innovated new technologies to avoid more CFCs. And people came together. Countries came together, the world came together to really fight for the planet that we are in right now. And I think one thing that we can learn from this in the story of the ozone layers is there is hope, but there is hope if we fight for it. Um, that's it. And maraming salamat po sa pakikinig, ipaglaban natin ang kalikasan at ang ating mga karapatan. Kung gusto nyo po, ay pwede nyo din po kaming samahan sa Dakila 
uh, para ipagpatuloy ang mga iba't iba nating laban. Maraming salamat po sa pakikinig. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Villalobos, or Josh, I'm sorry. So thank you very much, uh, Josh. That was really such an inspiring um, talk. And really, the, the quote really stayed with me. A fact wrapped in a story is um, 20, around 20 times more memorable than the fact alone. And since you did wrap uh, your recollection earlier in a story, I'm sure a lot of us are curious as to who the famous climate denier is. But uh, in the interest of time, we'll just move along with uh, the rest of the program. So it's also really in inspiring how your talk centered not just on using stories literally, but also in how we communicate the stories of activism, how we storify them. And really the struggle on climate action will be one in terms of how we communicate it. So uh, I'm also a fan of Christiana Figueres and her podcast. And she also talks about how climate denial has evolved into climate despair, climate inertia, climate delay. So at this point uh, of the program, we'll now be having our open forum, and we've gathered quite a number of questions from the chat. Uh, our first um, question comes from Eduardo Duqueza, and I guess behalf, on behalf of the rest of the audience, how can they get in touch with you and your organization? I know there may be members of the creative industry here or those who want to be involved in the creative industry. Um, yes, for Dakila, please uh, look at us in Facebook and also in Instagram at Dakila and also Activista. So, um, and also for my email, I'm dropping it in the chat. Thank you. Thank you very much. So for those in our audience who are interested in getting in touch with Dakila and in getting in touch with Josh, uh, please refer to the details in the chat box. Our next question comes from Badi Samaniego, and they ask, uh, what can you say about the argument about why we should call for accountability for corporations such as those in the fossil fuel industry when we all use and benefit from their products? So I know that, Josh, you tackled this partly, especially the, the, the lobbying influence and the power of the fossil fuel industry uh, during your presentation, but perhaps you'd like to add more uh, to address the question. Yes, thank you so much. And um, it's common, no? And people would usually not uh, call for accountability because of this. And when you actually also look at the things that, and how they do things, this is actually their message. This is their narrative um, to don't blame us because you're using our products. You should blame yourself. It's like the in the plastic, um, in the sachet economy, for example, in the use in the plastic pollution. They will also tell you that. Why would you blame us? Oh, so why would you blame the top 10 polluters when you're actually the one using the product? The response there is, do we have a choice? Um, or are we limited to actually what they are producing to us? And number two, even though we've used it, um, we can see, and it's clear, it is it um uh, news organizations and other sites have been publishing this, they have been profiting in this. Um, environmentally destructive business models, both for fossil fuels, for example, and in, in plastics. Um, and I'm so sorry, but they have always been lying about this. They will always say that uh, it's your it's your fault also because you're using this, but as if we can just choose to not use it, right? And this is actually also a concept of um, a, a lock-in, a cultural lock-in, that we are locked in this um, culture that we are conditioned to think that this is the only way that uh, we should do this and there's no other way. So, and there's also, of course, a concept of, um, then they will also say, but you can just shift to renewable energy, right? And But there are also some challenges, particularly in um, when you talk about for, for lower income countries and even lower income households, it's, challenging to shift to renewable energy because it requires a high investment. And I also had the several, uh, I'm currently my, another, my, one of my major themes of activism is also in energy. So um, I can talk yeah, about energy in a 
but I don't also want to bore you guys. But so I don't want to talk about that if you're not interested. But that's that's the answer. Number one, they've been profiting from it, and also they knew. Uh, researches and documents revealed that as early as 1950s or 70s, they already knew that their business model is gonna cause global warming and it's gonna cause changes in climate. But they continued to do it anyway, despite um uh, despite knowing that. And number two, it's because they're also not giving us a choice. And people for years and years, for decades, have been calling for an alternative, but they're not giving us an alternative. And I hope that answers your question. Uh, sorry for that uh, momentary disconnection. Uh, okay, so this shows this is one of the uh, ways that we can show how we are resilient <laughs> in terms <laughs> not just of climate but also in dealing with our systems. Um, I really like how you touched on uh, the lock-in system and really how it shows the fallacy and uh, almost the hypocrisy of how um, these large corporations and industries have been manipulating not only their consumers, but also decision makers, particularly uh, governments who negotiate uh, together during the conference of parties. Um, and it's also nice how you also mentioned uh, renewable energy. So just for the inf uh, the information of everyone in our audience, uh, one of our webinars, actually two of our webinars, will actually be dealing with the question on renewable energy in the Philippines. So that's our April 24 and May 8 session under the Climate Research um, Webinar Series. So the series after this. Okay. So uh, moving on to our next question, this comes from Mark Anthony Adviento. And they ask, what is your stand towards nuclear power or nuclear energy as an alternate source of power? Um, thank you so much. And even among the climate advocates and renewable energy advocates, there have been, it's a debate among us. Um, and personally, uh, and I think also I can represent the I can represent the Kila in this stance that um, a lot of issues still has to be addressed for renewable energy, particularly waste. That's number one issue. Um, number two, in the context of the Philippines, the there's no legal framework for it right now. And when you actually look at the the DOE um, study, I think uh, they've said that there will be 17 or 14 hurdles that needs to be addressed. And when we talk about the looming energy crisis in the Philippines, we need to develop more energy sources. But the thing with nuclear is it's not gonna, it cannot keep up. Um, because for example, the development of, of facility and the training of personnel will take, um, as experts said, would take at least 15 years for you to operate a nuclear plant with trained personnel to handle that. And we know also the threats of nuclear. We've seen um uh we've seen tragedies of nuclear um in Fukushima and we don't want that to happen in the Philippines. And we know right that we are in a uh Pacific ring of fire. And I think just today Taiwan has have a very strong um earthquake and that's of course gonna present another risk for our nuclear technology and also um and also uh we have the solutions with renewable energy and we believe that uh, a transition to a democratized and decentralized and distributed renewable energy is really the perfect solution okay. well maybe sorry not perfect but a better solution because it's more contextualized to the um, circumstances of the communities and it also addresses the social inequality associated with energy. Because when you look at our energy sector right now, they would say that the passage of IPIRA uh, or the law uh, that's, that provides the framework for our energy sector, it promised a democratization of the energy sector. But right now, it's not democratic at all. Um, the, our transmission, our transmission sector is owned by one corporation, and forty percent or fifty percent of the shareholder is um, at 
a Chinese corporation are owned by the uh by the government of China and then they actually said they can turn off our electricity if they want to and number two when you look at the generation sector or the ones that are producing our energy a huge percentage is produced by a small number of of generators or producers so you you're not really actually seeing um democratization of the energy sector there it's still being controlled and owned by a few people and one of the remaining public or and has some sort of democratic um levels or characters characteristics here is the distribution utilities um unless for unless your if your DUs have already been privatized like for example Miralco and some other privatized um, distribution utilities some distribution utilities are actually more um have more democratic characteristics and it's also an avenue for us to engage in in climate advocacy because you can actually um influence your distribution utility to get power from cleaner energy um so yeah i hope that answers your question that nuclear energy still has a lot of issues to be addressed and also um, a lot of safety, environmental, um, and also cost. So that also begs the question, does the cost actually, or, or does the benefit at least the cost of renewable, of nuclear energy? And for me, I don't think so. So, and then we already have the technologies and um, Currently, we are already transitioning to renewable energy. So I hope we don't spend money and energy, time and resources on spending it to false solutions. Like uh, for, for me, false nuclear energy is a false solution. Thank you very much, Josh. Uh, indeed, the question and the, the, the debate around nuclear is really a very nuanced uh, debate. So I appreciate how you also approach that from a very objective and very sobering uh, way. Uh, we have uh, a question from uh, one of our uh, audience members, uh, and uh, they write, it is said that one of the biggest challenges to climate change activism today is the observable fatigue among the audience or the public in terms of supporting climate narratives or calls to action. Some say the public is overexposed, but overly desensitized. How has storytelling in the context of climate justice activism adapted to address the skepticism or the fatigue that might set in with its audiences? And what strategies ensure that these stories continue to motivate and inspire action? Thank you so much. Ang um, comprehensive ng tanong. At try kong sagutin. Mukhang pang research question yun, no? Pero... Um... It's true. And for example, for a lot of people, when they see a new climate statistic, the yung parang response ay mag-scroll down na lang, no? Kasi it's just another day, another bad news for the climate, right? So people would rather not see that. And um, for advocates, it has been a challenge, no? To how to communicate and to ensure that your messages are actually getting across because... um. It's it's all it's not strategic to just produce and produce more information and more communication and you're not actually reaching the right audience. So I think for us it has been a challenge and actually we don't have a solution on it. But our response there is to continue to innovate and to test if what messages actually works for the certain audience, for a certain audience, and for the bigger general public in for the bigger general public. And um it's also a challenge for us, particularly for our comms department and the creatives people in the organization, uh, na palaging mag-innovate, no? palaging mag-try. And minsan nga ay ano na eh, parang kahit hanggang kahit geologs level at kahit ano, sinatry na namin yung iba't ibang messaging para lang malaman ko anong mag-work. And there are also several ways to test if your messages are working and um. There are usual ways that people engage in comms do, for example, testing the messages through FGDs before sending it out to public or um, doing surveys to test your messages. But if you don't also have the time and resource to do that, well, uh, you might as well just uh, trust your instinct and uh, believe that you're also a human being. So you can also believe in your capacity to judge the stories that you are publishing. 
Thank you. Thank you, Josh. Again, a very nuanced take and how sometimes it's not always about reaching 100% of the audience, but really the, the segment of the audience that we want to reach. So uh, before we move on to the next question, I just want to highlight that one of the one of our hub's uh, esteemed collaborators, Dr. Emma Porio, is here with us. Thank you, Doc Emma. Uh, and she has shared in the chat links to some of her the research projects where she is a principal investigator of. So uh, these are these are links to resilienttoolkit.ph and coastal cities at risk in the Philippines. So thank you very much, Doc Emma, for sharing that. I'm sure that this is very much appreciated by the members of our audience. So uh, moving on, uh, our next question is from Cipriano Fampulme. And uh, they write, my organization, ACMA, we're focusing on trained community reporters for stories of local climate actions from the grassroots. What is the difference between that and storytelling? Thank you. Um, thank you so much, Sir Cipriano. And thank you also for the work that you're doing in your community in the community reporters for stories of local climate actions. Um, I don't, I'm not familiar with how you, what is your uh, methodologies, for example, in delivering your stories, but I think it's also not very different with when it comes to, when it comes to storytelling. And basically storytelling is just telling a fact in a creative way, in a storified way. And I think it's um, almost similar. Um, yes. And also someone direct message me their question so i if i can just read this and also respond um there's a question from adrian mendoza and he said uh re recently guyana's president dr irfan ali stated the hypocrisy of greatest emitters to lecture the global south about the climate change when asked about the oil development in their country i would like i would like to ask for how can we help in promoting this call for common but differentiated responsibility or climate justice in general given the common knowledge that we are all equally liable thank you uh for the great talk thank you so much and um yes this is a concept in the negotiations though i will not also pretend that i'm an expert in the negotiations because they only attended the negotiations once um but uh, the common but differentiated responsibilities actually recognizes the different national scenarios and national circumstances of different countries. So, for example, when you are in a um when you're in a COP or when you're in a negotiating room, it is not it it is understood that the Philippines, for example, and the US does not have the same resp uh does not have the same responsibility, right? Or uh yeah, it's common but differentiated responsibility. We have a common responsibility, but it's also differentiated considering our uh, national circumstances, maybe because of our so social and economic standing, and also the his one of the one of the key concept there is also looking at the historical emissions and who has actually emitted more uh, before, and as I've shown um, in the one of the uh, graphics I've shown earlier. Um, Philippines is one of the smallest emitter in the world, and actually, um, we're also one of the leading voices, uh, particularly in representing global South countries in the negotiations. And um, so, how how do we promote? For me, it's still really calling for um accountability from and leadership and um. Ano bang tawag doon? Parang ipakita din ng mga developed countries na pangunahan nila yung daan, di ba? They cannot continue to say that um, we all have common responsibilities and actually throw us the burden. But they should also ensure that um, they are leading the way, they are doing their fair share, and they're also contributing to us uh, for us to adapt and mitigate the climate crisis. And I hope that answers your question. And then, yep. Thank you very much, uh, Josh. And we, we do appreciate that uh, a member of the audience felt comfortable enough to message you directly uh, for their question. Uh, just looking at the time, it's now 5.08. So perhaps we have room for uh, one last question. And this is actually a follow-up from uh, a previous question by Mark Anthony Adviento. And he's, uh, they say, thank you, sir. Uh, is it much better if we go for hydropower and building more dams? But another issue is the IPs or the indigenous peoples. 
And then on a dam, perhaps a, a floating solar farm. So another complex energy question. Yes. Um, well, of course, um, for me, uh, well, it's very complex, yes. And But for me, I would really con seriously consider the social impacts. And when you say, for example, big dams, um, it will most likely affect indigenous people and also local biodiversity and wildlife in that area. And for us, for many civil society in the Philippines, we have published um, 10 principles for a just energy transition and how it should be, uh, how it should happen in the Philippines or how should we implement renewable energy in the Philippines. And one of those is uh, should be respecting of human rights. Right and well, kaya din tinatawag siyang just energy transition because there should be a just aspect into it. We should we should really consider we should observe justice in the implementation of energy transition because kung hindi siya mag kasi kapag hindi siya mag observe ng justice and it's not actually gonna be transforming and addressing the social inequalities but actually will amplify the social inequalities and the marginalization. Well, uh, we're just we're not actually transitioning. We're just changing technologies, and transitioning is beyond changing technologies. It's it involves changing systems, addressing inequalities, and really putting justice at the core. So, um, if you if you are interested, I will also send in the chat the resource, uh, as the one I've mentioned on the, uh, ten principles for a just energy transition that has been agreed and uh, supported by uh, around 50 or 60 civil society and non-government organizations in the Philippines for a just energy transition. And I hope that answers your question. Thank you very much, uh, Josh, for your answers. And thank you as well to our participants for your questions. This was a very engaging open forum given the, the time that we had allotted for this and how much how, how many questions we were really able to speed through. So thank you very much, everyone, for that. We now move to the awarding of the certificate for our esteemed speaker. This certificate of appreciation is presented to Joshua Villalobos for sharing his time and insights in the webinar entitled The Power of Stories and Activism in the Pursuit of Climate Justice on the 3rd of April, 2024. The certificate is signed by Ms. Jean Hardelesa Mijares, the Program Manager for Climate and Disaster Resilience at the Ateneo Institute of Sustainability, and by Dr. Charlotte Kendra Gotanko Gonzalez, the Director of AIS and the focal point of the My Climate Risk Ateneo de Manila University Regional Hub. Thank you very much again, Mr. Villalobos, Josh, I'm sorry, for sharing your time and insights uh, with us. And now to give the closing remarks, may we call on Dr. Emma Porio, who is Professor Emeritus at the Department of Sociology and Anthropology at the Ateneo de Manila and a collaborator of the MCR Ateneo de Manila University Regional Hub. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, can you hear me? Hello. Yes, Dr. Emma, we can hear you. Yeah, okay. Thank you very much, uh, Josh, for doing this very uh, inspiring talk and sharing with us your stories. By the way, um, please give my regards to my good friends in Silliman, Dr. Ike uh, Orashon, Dr. Robert C. Gino, we were there and very good. I'm very envious of your you know, environmental programs and all your, you know, with the legacy of Dr. Alcala. I was a fan of Dr. Alcala and I'm very happy that you know, you're giving a talk with us. So please give my regards to my friends there. Uh, on behalf of the Ateneo de Manila University and the Ateneo Institute of Sustainability and the World Climate Research Program, thank you, Josh, for all your dynamic storytelling and creative activism. But most of all, I'd like to say thank you very much for making the voices of the youth like you, you know, really stand tall and proud and inspire us. But before I go into that, I'd like to share with you what I think 
uh, underscores all the creative activism that we should do. I think from the university, we've been arguing, you know, and and really fighting for what we call producing actionable science, or here we call it about actionable climate information, uh, which I think all of us should do in the university and so that it will be actionable, the science is actionable, it's consumable and relatable as what you have done. Uh, I think I agree with you that, you know, uh, putting, you know, facts, climate science models can, you know, be very, um, very clinical and very, you know, antiseptic, but with stories and um, films and narratives, it's more relatable and it's more actionable. But from the university side, I'd like to say, and I've been uh, basically um, asserting really that we should produce transdisciplinary action research so that it will be actionable and consumable. And I always tell my the scientists that I've been working with, you know, around 15 scientists or so um, in the coastal cities at risk, I always say that, you know, to, to do, you know, climate activism now and climate action, we should produce knowledge that is actionable and following three principles. Number one, we should co-produce knowledge with our stakeholders. If we do that, then we can uh, co-create our capacities as scientists, professionals, and practitioners. And if you do these two principles, then it can lead to co-ownership co-stewardship and co-benefits involved in both. And I'd say that, you know, the other perspective that I truly believe in and it should guide our action is the three principles of climate justice. One is really identity and recognition of the rights of people and groups. Number two, if we do recognize that each group regardless of race, gender, ethnicity, and class, then we should be able to uh, incorporate in our organization and in our ways of doing things, procedural justice. We should be able to say, are our procedures fair and equitable in whatever project programs that we design? Number three, we basically think that if we do recognize the rights of um, groups, regardless of class, gender, and ethnicity, and sexuality, then we should be able to do, you know, justice in our procedures, fair and equitable. Then we should be able to talk of distributive justice. I think the third is really the hardest. And I think your stories and creative uh, acti activism that you're doing is really very important in getting the stories of uh, injustice on the ground, as well as um, showing it how we can you know, be more fair and equitable in distributing the resources. And like, for example, you're talking about the IPs. Uh, you're, you're talking about the indigenous peoples. For example, if you do, um, you know, call a coal power plant there, or uh, you do quarrying, you do all those um, extractive, extractive um, activities on the mountains, you see them like the quarrying, the mining, and all this deforestation. Oftentimes, the most that are really affected are people down there. And we in Metro Manila, we in the cities do not know what's happening out there. For example, I was asking a student of mine, I said, do you know where our water comes from in Manila? It comes from Angata. We, we do not know that this the water comes from the mountains and all the resources. And we just here in, in the city, we just um, we just enjoy those, you know, natural resources. And I was telling her also that we people in the city are always extracting resources from the countryside, but we don't really respect the people that produce the food, that produce the fruits and vegetables. And also really, I think that we have to be part. I always say that if you want to be part of the solution, you should also know what we are, that you are part of the problem. I always tell my students that, you know, at the rate we are consuming the Earth's resources, we need three planets to sustain our lifestyle. Our consumption-driven lifestyle and all this processing, um, I always uh, tease my students, there is no mineral in the bottled mineral water. 
I was I was in Cebu, I was in Cebu um, two weeks ago, and you know, in Cebu they have to some of them are already desalinating salt water because of the shortage of water, and I was um, one of the and they were giving us um, distilled water, you know. And I was uh, amused when the chemist of the desalinating companies looks at this distilled water and says, oh, this distilled water, once it enters your body, it will search for the minerals that it needs to be absorbed. And, and for me, I'm thinking, oh my God, you know, what, what I'm basically saying is that distributive justice is very important that we have to look at. And, and and we have to practice this in our own engagements with people. Like I was telling my student who was going to go to one of the islands to do DRM studies. And I said to her, what do you know about the DRM plants of this island? And she doesn't know. And I said, Google there, each local government has DRM plants. So what you should do is, you know, uh, I, I said to her, we people from the city are so fun of just going down there and disturbing the people, not knowing they are just so busy, you know, and we people from the city are so demanding, oh, we can give us this data and things like that. And I said to her, what is it for? You disturb the people there for your data needs, for your thesis, but what, what, what do you have in return? I, I think we have always to think about the relationship of extraction, when I, that's why I always say co-production co-creation, co-ownership, co-stewardship, because um, I, I think we have been uh, so um, focused on, you know, being the best that we can be by excelling through in our own efforts, not knowing that to really to achieve things that really matter, not only for you, but for the whole community, you have to be, um, I would say, you know, um, we talk about collateral damage. We also say that you have to be collegial. You have to be, um, if if we say, you know, oh, this one is relatable, that means that you can relate to conditions of the work, the conditions of um, the, the exchange of relationship. I think so many times our, you know, we create our conditions of relationships, hierarchies. You know, I, I go down there and, you know, get uh, information from the village. You look at the community, you look at the group as a source of information to extract, but you do not know that you co-produce, you co-produce that ever knowledge. And I think if you're just so concerned about producing your own knowledge for what, then it doesn't really lead, you know, to possible collaboration, to possible, um, you know, creation of solutions that, will benefit for all of us. So um, I I stop my homily here because I always I always you know I've been working with you know scientists in the coastal cities at risk. And when we started working, you know, ten years ago, and I always said, you know, by being together we can be more. You know, I I think this is now we have to be enter and transdisciplinary in our work. And when you say transdisciplinary, we have to work with other disciplines, with other professionals, and with practitioners. I think we have no business really talking about our science when we do not know how it really works for the people on the ground. And what is the meaning of that really? So I would like to congratulate you, Josh and Dakila, for leading us the way. I really think that um, you know scientists, professionals, and practitioners have to be in one room and should be in conversation and saying, okay, um, my job as a scientist is to produce a science, but at the same time, the production of that should be co-generated with this with the people, with the stakeholders, and find what is the meaning of that and what are the implications of this science. And we know that the implications vary according to social locations of people. And so we, we have to be always aware that there are power relations embedded. And I'm, I like, you know, in your um, responses to uh, the questions that, you know, you are very aware and I wish, you know, a lot of the people are aware, but I think we should also practice it really. That when we say, um, you know, we look at the people as our source of information, as well as a source of inspiration, but we really give also due justice to their role and, really to 
a, a recognition of their contribution. For example, you know, you mentioned we, you know, the indigenous peoples and especially the poor have the least contribution to climate emissions. The third world have the least climate emissions. But the impacts of disasters, of flooding, landslides, earthquakes, it's the poor that suffers most. In fact, our studies show that every typhoon, the informal households always loses more. That means that every typhoon, the inequality widens because the bottom third always loses more. And um, so I, I think we, we have to be conscious of our role in the production of inequality or the production of equitable relationships, okay? So uh, I'd like to say that, you know, thank you. I think we should always inspire each other. We have to be, I always say that this risk to resilience journey, we have to be together because if we cannot be together, then how can we work? As I always tell the scientists, by being together, we can be more, but I will also say to innovate, innovate is to collaborate, but to collaborate is to navigate the systems that we are in. So uh, thank you for, I really like, I mean, I would like to share that in 2018, uh, when I started the Coastal Cities Risk Act 2, I had 150 pages of report, the Coastal Cities at Risk 1, which, you know, included, you know, Bangkok, uh, Manila, uh, and other cities. I gave to the, uh, here, Arete is a cultural hub. And so our artist here, and I gave our report, 150 pages, Josh. And the artist just trans translated in the 20 panels. Why is Metro Manila um, a flood prone? What is the method? And then what can we do? So I think I'm very, um, I fully agree with you that to make our science consumable, relatable. And I like your, you know, putting out the, the facts and the evidence. But as I always tell the, um, the LGUs, how can we be evidence-based when your staff cannot even recognize when they see an evidence one? You know, when you go down and you say, what's your evidence? What's your data? What's your information? And so I think, uh, I'd like to congratulate you, you and your group for doing this kind of work. And I'd say that with activism, with creative activism, creative narratives, I think there is no room for climate anxiety. Some people in the West with their climate anxiety is not ever anymore having children because they say, how can I have children? And what kind of earth they are inheriting. But I would say, what is the antidote to climate anxiety? What is antidote to climate desperation? It's really action. Be part of the creative action that will change the conditions. And to change the conditions, I always tell my student, what is your theory of change? You have to understand what is your location of the problem and what is it that you can do? So um, I always tell people now that, how do you understand the world? How do you intend to change it? And that we're just a dot. But again, I think stories and narratives are you know, really inspiring posts that we should have. And you know, I think, um, shall we say, climate um, anxiety and all this desperation or hopeless, it, it doesn't really contribute to anything. I think you have to make up your mind that only action will lead to some fruition. And uh, being, um, I always tell my students here in Ateneo, it doesn't take talent to complain, but it takes talent to provide an alternative. So I would always tell them, decide which group you want to become. Because if you're just complaining, then I don't have to have, you know, it doesn't contribute to anything. So. I'd say that the current condition that we are in now, and, and you erased that, really pushes each of us to do what we can do to be part in the solutions pathway, rather than you know the complaining pathway. And we find ourselves tired because we're just you know complaining makes you tired, complaining makes you depressed. So I'd say that you know creative action 
look at what you can do. Action, really, um, action and creative. I mean, I would say everyone has creativity, productivity, and I'd say that you become bored and you become um, unhappy when you are not mobilizing the creativity and the dynamism that is within us and share it. Share whatever you can do. Share whatever talents you can do to the larger group. So thank you very much and congratulations again, Joshua and Dakila and Active Vista and AIS and the World Climate Research Program. Thank you, Daniel and everyone. Thank you, Jean. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Porio. It's always inspiring to hear the principles of transdisciplinary action research. And thank you very much for tying that in with the principles of climate justice. Uh, at this point, may we request everyone to please turn your videos on for a few seconds so we can take a group photo for documentation. Hi, Josh. Tell Robert and Ike, thank you. So we can fit everyone in two screens. We'll just give a few more moments for uh, our other members of the audience to turn their cameras on. All right, I will be taking the photo of the first page. Uh, now moving on to the second page. So this is the analysis because uh, it's just too complex. Thank you very much, everyone. It's wonderful to see everyone's smiles. <laughs> Thank you, Daniel. Thank you, everyone. So uh, can we have the slides up for the next part of the program? I promise that we are nearing the end of our program. <laughs> so to our dear participants, uh, we are uh, very happy to also announce uh, that since uh, Josh, our speaker earlier, did mention about climate stories and how we all have our own climate stories, we also invite you to submit to us whether you have climate stories uh, of your own. So the MCR Ateneo de Manila University Hub is also uh, releasing this call for submissions uh, for climate stories, uh, no matter what those impacts or what those stories may entail. This is grounded on the belief that we are all storytellers and scientists, and we seek to elevate the Southeast Asian voice in terms of sharing what kind of climate impacts and what kind of climate risks we face as a region. So it's time for us to decolonize climate science and cli the, the, how, how these stories are told. So if you'd like to... Um, know more about uh, this initiative, you may refer to the link that has been shared in the chat by our tech team. And of course, uh, we would like to request everyone to please answer the evaluation survey with the QR code and link flashed on the screen. Requests for e-certificates for attendance may also be coursed through the same form. Thank you once again to Josh. And of course, thank you to our two sign language interpreters, Ms. Edna Comia and Ms. Annalisa Registolentino. They have been with us for three years uh, and counting. So we're very thankful for all of your support in making our events more inclusive to the deaf community. And to all of you, our audience members, thank you very much for your participation in this webinar. We hope you have gained fresh insights on the topic, especially on the role of stories and activism in climate justice. Please don't forget to accomplish our event evaluation form. Our tech team has also posted the link in the chat. Again, if you would like to uh, request for e-certificates, they can be coursed by answering the evaluation form.
So we hope to see you again, uh, as this is our first session, we hope to see you again in our next webinar, which is happening in exactly two weeks on the 17th of April, where we will be exploring podcasting as a medium to unpack climate trauma by looking at the experience from Super Typhoon Yolanda, or uh, internationally known as Typhoon Haiyan. You may register for the next session in our link tree. So thank you very much, everyone, and enjoy the rest of the day.